Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Podin. I'm a partner here at Haber Law. I'm joined today by um, some colleagues, my partner at the law firm, the founding shareholder, David Haber. He is a board certified condominium attorney, construction defect attorney and business litigator um, here in South Florida. Uh, he's one of only a few hundred board certified condominium attorneys and he's been one of the thought leaders on condominium leadership, proposed changes to condominium law, board operations, repair projects in the wake of the unthinkable tragedy in Surfside. David, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my we're, pleasure, David. We're also joined on this panel by Donald Kipnis. Donald is the founder and CEO of DSS Condo. He has a long storied and successful track record in South Florida in the construction industry, going back to one of the most prolific general contractors in South Florida, where he was the CEO of Miller and Solomon General Contractors. After Miller and Solomon General Contractors, Donald was a partner and executive vice president of construction for the Trump Group. And then Donald I don't want to say recently because it's actually been probably, if I had to guess, about 10 years now. Have you guys had your 10th anniversary? Or am I off on that? Has been the founder and CEO of DSS Condo, which is one of the leading project management owner rep firms specializing in condominium repair projects. Donald, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. It is close to 10 years now. Thanks. I thought I, 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 I thought I was close on that. Also, we're joined by DSS's CFO, Adam Snitzer. Adam's business career spans more than 25 years at many of the country's top corporations, including American Express, Royal Caribbean, and Carnival Corporation. He's known for his passionate focus on customer services, as well as client satisfaction and problem solving. He has an MBA from NYU, where he studied operations, finance, and marketing. Adam, thank you for joining thank, us as well. Thank you, David. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Just to jump right into it, I'm going to kick it to Adam and then uh, David Haber as well. We now, um, not just in our little niche of the professional world of condo attorneys and construction project managers, but everyone sort of, um, it's on their minds in terms of condo repair projects, reserves, assessing the condition of buildings. It's, it's something that because of the tragedy in Surfside, so many people are talking about. But to start sort of at the beginning, if, if you're either on a board or you're a project manager and you need to assemble a team for one of these major projects, Adam, can you, can you speak to like the role of an owner's rep or project manager on that team? And if you and David can also speak to the other players that you need on the team for these these major you know, repair projects at condominiums, whether it's garden style or high rise? Well, David, thank you for that question. It's an outstanding question. An owner's rep firm like DSS Condo manage, manages a construction project and as the name implies, safeguards the interests of the owners, okay? And we go about that in a number of different ways. Um, you know, reviewing the drawings, creating a project plan, uh, a realistic budget and schedule, assembling the right team of participants, you know, to your question is to make sure that the condominium community assembles the right design professionals, contractors, subcontractors, specialty vendors on a project so that we've got the right people who are um, experienced and qualified to do the work. Um, we also <clears throat> work with the association's attorney to negotiate contracts. We manage the permitting process. We orchestrate all of the project participants' activities, you know, throughout the entire uh, pre-construction and construction project. You know, um, David, large developers have entire teams of people who do this for them. Small developers always hire a consultant to do it for them. DSS Condo is unique in that we specialize in providing these critical services to the condominium community. And, and David, if you could speak to, because you have a tremendous amount of experience dealing with 
board of directors. They're volunteer board of directors, and they find themselves in this position of having to do these big projects. So what, what is the lawyer's role and what is the role of the team that these directors need to surround themselves with? Let me start by saying that the board of directors um, has a fiduciary duty to the condominium. And as such, they are protected by the business judgment rule, which means that so long as you are exercising reasonable business judgment, you are immune from suit. Uh, boards get into trouble when they ignore a project that needs to be done and someone gets hurt or someone's car gets crushed or whatever it is, um, if they were reckless or willful um, in, their, in their decisions. One of the best ways to avoid that and to use what's called reasonable business judgment is to rely upon experts. When you rely upon experts as a board member, you have protection and you have immunity. So you always want to rely on your management company. You want to rely on your lawyer's opinions. You want to rely on your owner's rep's opinion. You want to rely upon your engineer's opinion. So when you're looking at a project, I think the first thing is to try to figure out the scope of the project. And we'll talk about scope a little bit later. I know Donald and, and Adam and I have a lot to say about that. But in order to get your team together and you need a team of experts, you start with the lawyer. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a lawyer, Adam and, and Donald will concur. And the reason is because you have to negotiate the first contract, whether it's with the owner's rep or whether it's with the engineer who's scoping the project, you must have the lawyer drafting the contract. Your manager cannot practice law. The board should not practice law. Even if board members are lawyers, you should rely on experts and professionals. So when you negotiate those contracts and you will ultimately need contracts with the owner's rep, the architect or engineer, as well as the contractor. So you have the lawyer working on different contracts at different times. And you have to understand that this is a process. If the board votes to do a project. It's not like you snap your fingers and the project starts. You have to figure out scope. You got to get your team together. You got to then get specs together. You also have to go bid that out to contractors, decide who's, who's a qualified contractor to bid, then select your contract, then negotiate the contract, and then they have to mobilize and get started. And this process can take anywhere from three months to a year. So Getting the team together is important, and the first person on the team is typically the lawyer. And you touched on, uh, you're making my job easy, you touched on the next point to segue into project scope. And so a lot of times um, these projects start out as there's a need for a repair, um, and they seem to balloon or take on a life of their own. But uh, Donald, with all your construction experience being on the GC side, now being on the project management side, can you speak to the best way to approach identifying and establishing the universe of the project scoping when DSS gets brought in on something like this? Sure, I'd be happy to help. So the project scope is, is more than the physical work or improvement being performed. Um, that's the obvious. The hidden part, which is as critically important as anything is this pre-construction phase and determining through field study, uh, destructive testing, visual, what the true scope of the work is going to be so the plans and specifications can be written for the bid and permitting process. It's really the foundation, the, the pre-construction and, and field study or the foundation for the success of the entire project. Because the bid, the permit, the loan, the work itself is all based on that. So the pre-construction is complex. It's time consuming. Uh, people want to go faster rather than slower. And you really want to take your time, be meticulous, and be thorough. Because at the end of the day, even the field study is a statistical analysis of the whole building. So you really want to have a contingency associated with whatever is done to mitigate any overrun. 
I hope that helped answer. Certainly. So could you give us some specifics in terms of if um, maybe one of the classic examples would be a, a stucco repair project in terms of the destructive testing and the process that you know DSS would oversee with an engineer or someone? Sure, by, by visual, you can see cracking, spalling, and what really needs to be done is those areas opened up, chipped back, and investigated with the engineer and with a statistician to also pick areas that don't have cracking or spalling to see if there are any underlying or hidden problems so that what might become a simple stucco patch becomes a much more severe uh, concrete remediation project. You know, one, one of the things that uh, was problematic in Surfside at Champlain Tower South was the fact that it took so long to get approval for the project. It took about 18 months uh, to two years. And one of the reasons is because what was started as a six or seven million dollar project ballooned into a 14 or 15 million dollar project. Donald, can you talk about rebar corrosion and how it becomes exponential. Like if you have a small problem, um, it can become a much worse problem. And instead of just costing a little bit more, it can cost two, three, four times as much. And the whole concept of chasing rebar to find good rebar. Sure. So at the end of the day, water intrusion is the enemy. And once there's a little bit of water gets to the rebar, the reinforcement bar, which has iron in it, it rusts and rust expands and it creates a bigger crack. And that allows more water to get in. So deferred maintenance typically leads to more expensive and more extensive repairs. And on a balcony repair, for example, you could chase rebar right into a unit owner's apartment following until you get the clean rebar to attach to. So maintaining buildings, keeping the waterproofing and the painting up to date uh, and not deferring that maintenance is critically important. It, it really can't be overemphasized. Donald, I wanna, and I don't mean to uh, usurp my partner's role as moderator, <laughs> but could you talk about the imperative of having a building spec for balcony waterproofing. Because as you know, in some of the older buildings, you have people putting on tile at different points in time. And if you don't have a good waterproofing spec, that water gets trapped between the tile and the concrete, causing degradation, which you don't even see because there's tile over it. So, you know, a lot of buildings are turned over without a building spec. And I mean by spec specification, for how to do the integration of the waterproofing under the tile and how it integrates with the sliding glass doors and the balcony edge. Can you talk about that for a minute? Sure, well, new buildings, the balconies have to be waterproof. Also, AstroTurf, artificial grass, uh, put directly on concrete is not allowed because that would trap moisture. And especially on an unwaterproof uh, balcony, it just leads to destruction of the rebar and spalling. I think um, the, the, through the engineer, there yeah. are many typical specifications now written for waterproofing of balconies. And they can be incorporated legally um, through the condominium association. Looking at, retrospectively, looking at balconies that have tile on them that didn't have any waterproofing is um, is more difficult and would be part of a remediation investigation process, part of the field process. If it's showing rebar spalling below the balcony, David, tile's going to be taken up. It's yeah, and it could and it, right? it could be taken up all the way into someone's unit. Um, and and board members have to be aware that the tile inside the unit is the overburden. That's the responsibility of the unit owner, although none of them want to hear that. Mm. Um, 
That's the other for sure, I'll, I'll turn it back over to your uh, partner, David Podine. Sure. So on, on that, in terms of these repair projects and the scope, David, what have you seen in terms of boards saying, well, if we're going to rip up the parking garage and the pool deck and do all these repairs, why don't we make it a little nicer? Why don't we add some landscaping and a jacuzzi or change this or change the, the use of the sun deck into a tennis court? What have you had to do in terms of dealing with boards that think, hey, you know, it's it's a repair project and then it morphs into something else. So um, first of all, I would say, as we talked about, you got to figure out the scope. And one of the things that you have to do is do drops of the building. You may have to use drones, you use visual inspection, you do destructive testing, but you may need a sampling plan, which a sampling plan is done by a statistical expert who says if you if you check this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, and on the other side of the building, you check the other eight spots, and they and they come up with a calculation of how you do that through some program called Python, I believe. Um, then you get a good analysis of what the building needs. One of the key components is communicating with the owners. One of the biggest problems in condominiums is when you tell people X and you end up with Y. They feel, whether they feel distrustful, uh, mistrustful, whether they feel like someone's doing something wrong, you know, no good deed goes unpunished as a board member, but communication is the key. So once you have your scope of work, a lot of times people will say, well, let's improve the pool. Let's add a jacuzzi. Let's do landscaping. And as David Podine is going to talk about now, that can constitutes in many cases material alterations which requires unit owner approval so david why don't you talk about the issue of what's a material alteration and what kind of approvals you need and how the board can't just do what they want and of course then you get to the issue of you have to do renderings which take time and you have to get the approval for the rendering and the rendering has to look a lot like what you end up with at the end um, yeah, it's, it's difficult because it slows down the whole process. One of the primary responsibilities of the board is to maintain the common elements. That's what you're hiring DSS or, or another firm to help you with is, is a set, you're starting out with this repair project. And yes, it's nice to do upgrades. It's nice to keep up with the competing buildings. And, and you'll hear plenty of arguments that it's, it's good for property values, but it's going to slow down your primary function of of maintaining the building and getting going with your repair project. Because once you get into alterations, which is basically just a palpable change that you can see, it's a very, very low threshold. Florida uh, condominium law has not been nice to condominium directors and associations that want to spruce up their buildings through alterations. It's a very low threshold. You've got to go out and get a vote on those changes that David talked about. And it's very hard to describe them merely through words. So oftentimes we recommend you go and get a rendering to say, this is what the new altered pool deck will look like without the tennis court and adding the jacuzzi and the sun deck and the landscaping. That takes time. And then oftentimes there's another vote that you'll have to do, which we'll get into more when we talk about budget and funding because you're gonna have to special assess. And now you can't just use the board's authority and the board vote to utilize funds for the common element repairs, you now have to specially assess at a unit owner level to spend funds on the special alteration project. So it can really overcomplicate and slow down projects, which can really be a problem. Well, the way that, I'm, I'm sorry, let me, if I may just interject, you know, in our experience at DSS Condo, it is very common for condominium associations to want to beautify the building for the reasons that David Podine just mentioned. They want to keep up, you know, the property values. They, you know, they want to live in a building that, you know, you know, they want to improve the amenities, the, the beautification. The way that we approach it is we divide the projects. And we said we have, for example, we would have a tower project that is concerned with structural repairs. And then we would have a lobby or a hallway project. And we put those onto different timelines so that the so that as you were saying, David, that the need for approvals for material alterations, uh, the need to create, you know, 
you know, mood boards and renderings and, and getting all those votes don't slow us down in terms of balcony repair, stucco repair, you know, HVAC and, and roofing repairs. We, we separate those uh, into, um, into separate, separate timelines and separate critical paths. But it comes back, I think, to what David Haber was saying. It's important to get the full scope, right? If you, do the, if you have beautification that's part of your original scope, and you say, okay, we have the money to do this, or you know, we're gonna raise the money to do this, and we're gonna build this into the project from the get-go, then it can work quite well. Is that once you see that the pool is being ripped up for, for structural repair, when you start to make decisions then about doing decking and changing the tiki huts and the cabanas, that's when things get very, very expensive and very complicated and can really slow down the job. Yeah, and, and I would say that <clears throat> after Surfside, the structural repairs and not allowing maintenance to get deferred is so much of a priority with engineers and with the building official um, that boards and unit owners, and, and this is part of what I've written in a New York Times op-ed and in Miami Herald, um, there are going to be significant changes to the law. The Florida Bar um, Committee just came out with its recommendations, which includes not waiving reserves for life safety issues, which I've been recommending. Um, that stuff's going to have to get done. And that could be a two to three year process in some cases, because if it's six months to get the owner's rep, get the engineer, get the bid specs, and then bid it out and select the bidder, I mean, select the contractor, and then get the contract with the contractor, you could be 18 months to two years on the actual remediation project. So I would almost say you work on parallel tracks for your material alteration project. You do a separate special assessment for that, but then you coordinate the work through your owner's rep, your engineer, your contractors, because it may be a different contractor for the landscape and the pool than it is for the concrete restoration, but you have them on parallel tracks moving together forward, but you cannot slow down your concrete restoration, your, your sliding door restoration or whatever your, your deferred maintenance and, and, and structural repairs are so that you can put, you know, some prettier tile on. You, you just can't. Uh, be, and, and the reason is not just safety, it's cost, because if you wait three years to do that remediation project, it can go from six to $15 million very easily. So the sooner you do it, the better. One other point, uh, David, you brought up earlier for the rendering, because we've come up against it before. If there are details shown on the rendering, which are approved by the association in the special assessment, that somehow don't get brought into the construction and permit document. And the contract is written on the construction document. The resident can expect to get what's in the rendering. Well, Podine and I would argue, David Podine and I would argue that you better give them what's in the rendering. Right, that, and that's the if, point. The renderings if, are critical that they get faithfully incorporated into the, the contract documents, the permit documents, that nothing is missed. So I have a question for David Podine, since I'm going to moderate for a moment. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do, David Podine, when one of these two issues comes up? Number one, you have a 40 or 50 year old building and you can't comply with the concept of you know, the same or similar material because they don't make that color carpet anymore or they don't make that pattern anymore. They don't make that tile anymore. Do you have to then get approval for a material alteration? That's the first question. Follow-up question to that is, you do a rendering, everybody approves the rendering. Half the building loves it, half the building hates it, but the board approves it. And then you're halfway through and they don't have the material that you spec'd and that you put in the rendering. And now you have to pick a different pattern or a different color or a different type of tile. How do you deal with those two situations? 
Well, on the latter one, uh, I would say tough luck. You have to go back to your residence and get an updated approval. If, if your ma proposed material alteration, what you're proposing to do, some nice, beautiful wood paneling all along, you know, tropical, modern interpretation, whatever, you're not, you, you can't have those materials at all, and it's going to be different, and you're going to have to get another vote. Because that's well, what, what you proposed. Now, in the in the other example you gave, you were stuck with what you had, and I do think if you try to comply with it, you document that those materials are not available. You go with something similar, and you you act reasonable and not go with something crazy. I think the board is protected and and saying that we're doing our best in documenting it in meeting minutes. That we tried to obtain this crazy 1970s carpet, but it's no longer available. So we're going as close as we can and in, in, uh, of like kind in nature. And then that would not be considered a material alteration. Would you, would, you, uh, would you agree that the best way for the board to document that is through management, owner's rep, and the lawyers as the experts so that the board has cover? Exactly. They can help with in terms of trying to solicit and find these materials. And uh, as much as it might seem like a minor detail or something that's annoying, sort of striking out on finding these, striking out on procuring these should be documented. Um, so you have, as a director, you have cover um, for going with a different material because it's not available. Um, and, and I would argue that if they don't have Ipe wood and they have Kumaru wood, that would be okay. And if it's beige tile and they don't have Italian marble, but they have Brazilian marble, that that could be acceptable so long as it's of like kind and quality, even in a, a renovation where you're doing an improvement and a material alteration, which was the second question. Um, how would you define a rendering? Someone asked that, Joan Clark asked that question. I'm saying sketches, um, material boards where you put up the materials. What else, Donald? Well, there's actually rendering software that creates uh, almost photographic like pictures of what's going to be built. They're 3D, they're from different angles. And that, that's how I would define the render. And it's in the voters' package. Uh, someone else asked a question. Um, what if our board has dismantled our hallways, did not submit rendering as to the finished product, nor vote on the renderings? Then what do we do? Well, you you either get a lawyer to help you overturn the board, you go to the DBPR and you file a complaint, or you file a lawsuit. Um, I've answered a bunch of the other questions. Um, let me see what's open. There's one open. And that's the one. Oh, Diana Reef says I'm hired. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, these are tough issues, you know, and boards don't always get it right. And sometimes you have obstinate boards, but I would argue that if they have good lawyers and good management, um, you know, like some of the big management companies, um, some of whom's management people are on this webinar, um, then you're you're going to seek out their advice and you're going to avoid those pitfalls, hopefully. Um, yeah. Now everyone's least favorite topic within this category, the budget. How much is it going to cost and where are we going to get the money from? So in terms of how much it's going to cost, I'm going to ask Donald because I'd like you to speak on at what point in the process will the association have an understanding of how much it's going to cost? This is the big question. How much it's going to cost? When are we going to have the budget? And then David Haber and I can speak to where the money is going to come to pay for the project for the budget that DSS is going to help you come up with. So can you speak, Donald, to how do we come up with a budget? How does DSS help come up with an accurate budget? When does that occur in this process? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about when it occurs and how it occurs. So the short answer is it really occurs after the bid process has taken place. 
So the field study has been done. All the engineers and architects, whomever, are on board. Field study, plans and specifications written. The plans are in for permitting. The plans have gone out to bid. Owner's rep has done an analysis on the bid. And now you have a really good idea of what all the costs are. You know, everyone's contract, you know, permit fees, scope of work, to put a good healthy contingency, especially on a concrete restoration project. Again, these are statistical analysis that are being done. There is a plus or minus. Depending on the nature of the concrete restoration, we suggest at least a 20% contingency. Because what you don't want at the end of the day is to run over. It happens sometimes. You don't have to spend the contingency. Money unspent doesn't get assessed. But to have a contingency there allows for a project to be completed when unknowns are encountered. I, I, would, I would agree with Donald and I would go further to say um, the more maintenance you do and avoid deferred maintenance, the lower this special assessment and this project is gonna be in terms of scope. And that really is where the board and management needs to communicate immediately nowadays that budgets may get more expensive, not just because you can't waive assessments, I mean, uh, waive reserves anymore and you're gonna have to assess for it, but also because you're gonna have more continual maintenance to avoid uh, deferred maintenance expenses that go into the millions of dollars. So you may spend an extra 50 or $75,000 a year to deal with concrete and, and, and spalling or injecting into concrete or waterproofing where, where it's failing in planters and the like so that it doesn't get into the garage and cause more, destruct, more destruction to the columns. Um, but, I, but I also think that, and I'd like Podine to talk about this, the difference between an exact assessment and a not to exceed assessment, can you do, you know, instead of a seven and a half million dollar assessment, are you allowed to do a ten, not to exceed 10 million and get a line of credit? Certainly, um, I, that's a great point. And I think it helps in terms of it's sometimes with the timing of the project and when you have to go for the vote and you're not sure if you're gonna do a loan, you're not sure how many people are gonna utilize the financing and thus how much the interest is gonna be. So I uh, very often will work with the project management team, the owner's rep and the board at coming up with a not to exceed budget figure. Once we have the line item estimates and budget for the project, we estimate what the professionals are gonna need, contingency amount, if it's gonna be a loan, a very conservative estimate, on what the interest rate will be. And then I get a lot of flack for this, but I'm tough on it. I say you have to assume each unit owner will utilize the financing and then what that interest amount will be. So then you say that actually the full potential amount of the special assessment is not to exceed this figure. Then you can always go lower. No one's going to complain that you are under the not to exceed figure. Because you're going to have people that prepay that don't want to utilize the loan and don't want to pay interest. You'll have people that sell their units. And as part of the buyer seller negotiation, the special assessment will be paid off at the transfer of the unit. But you can't estimate, you can't guess and then be short on how many people are going to pay their special assessment with the payment plan and utilize the loan and thus incur the interest charge. You have to assume they're all going to do it. So that's, I think, a conservative way and best approach to come up with the number you present to the membership on what to approve. And David, the lawyer is heavily involved in this process, both in the loan closing and helping negotiate the terms of the loan and the, and the commitment letter, is that correct? Heavily involved. And I wanna be involved before the commitment letter. I wanna see a list of the banks that the associations are thinking of using. Um, we have experience with many of them and some know what they're doing and some don't. A condo loan is a very specialized project, product. There's no mortgage, there's special terms, you have to comply 
with the Condo Act 718 and special ways and the type of security and collateral that you grant. You can't just come in with an out-of-state bank that doesn't have experience or, and or a lender's counsel that doesn't have experience with these special loan documents. And it can be a mess and it can eat, it can slow down your project, it can run up the cost of your project, as opposed to really having a team of people that know what they're doing in this special kind of product. Uh, I would like to ask one other question, David. Isn't it true that when it comes to the loan and it comes to the special assessment, you have to decide up front as the board whether or not you're going to call, call for acceleration of the indebtedness on a sale, on a due on sale clause versus the new owner just takes over the payments? You have to do that up front, don't you? You have to do that up front as part of the way the special assessment is passed. If you're going to require it to be paid off in full um, when a unit is transferred. And sometimes they'll say, oh, well, um, so-and-so is selling their unit for millions and millions of dollars. You know, why don't we don't want, we want it to be paid off when it's transferred. Well, if you don't pass a special assessment in that particular way with that requirement up front, you're pretty much uh, crap out of luck. Uh, for trying to enforce it after the fact. So now- I, I, would, I would argue though, that you have to be careful on due on sale clauses because if a bank is foreclosing and there's a $20,000 special assessment and 1% of the mortgage loan is $3,000, you're gonna get the lesser of 12 months of maintenance or 1% and you're gonna wipe out $17,000 of special assessment money. So be careful what you ask for. You know, Some people say, yeah, I wanna get the money quicker. But if you do that, you risk on a foreclosure, uh, losing out a lot of that special assessment money to the bank. Spot on, that, that's the real inside baseball, really getting into the details of, of how these things work planning it and then also in turn like exactly what David said be careful what you wish for that's why I think having experienced practitioners on the project management side and the legal side helps so much so now we have a budget we have a special assessment that's been approved how are we going to get a contractor how is DSS going to help us get good pricing how are we going to run this bid process, Donald? How are you going to beat up these GCs? How are you going to get apples to apples bids? What are you doing? You were on the other side bidding projects. Now you're beating these gals and guys up. Walk us through the, the bid process. Let's uh, start with how um, the names of the contractors are arrived at. Uh, what we like to see is the association side, the engineer, property manager, ourselves, uh, attorney, get together and put out names, throw names in the hat that they believe would be viable for the project. And that really starts the vetting process. Um, then based on everyone's familiarity with the marketplace, ourselves, we start making calls check on past performance, check with past clients, interview key people they're talking about putting on the job, superintendent, project manager, you know, establish a sense of capability of not just the contractor, but the team they're putting would put on our job. Because so, it's great, contractors, so, it's not- Donald, I want to ask, Donald, I want to ask you a question. Sure. Would it be fair to say that DSS Condo, working on as many projects as you work on, knows who the good contractors are, and more importantly, knows who within those companies are the best project manager uh, from, from that construction team, know who's done a good job on prior projects of similar scope, uh, size, and type, and that that's one of the value added that your company brings? That is one of the value added. I go, and not to the detriment of DSS Condo, I don't want to take out of the equation a superintendent that may have come from another company and be super capable. They could be a PE with 20 years of 
you know, field experience, and we haven't worked with them before. That's why it's really critical to find out who's going to be running our job. Um, and also, you want to understand the litigation and track record with bonds and liens. And, and, you know, your firm is really great at this and doing some snooping around because then you start to understand the perspective of ownership, of upper management with the construction company. Yeah, and, and while many of the companies are ultimately sued here or there, um, I can say that there are certain companies you just want to avoid. Um, there are certain engineers you want to avoid. Um, but, and not the, this, but not on this webinar. <laughs> no, not on this webinar. But my, my point is that, you know, I do construction litigation. I'm now litigating against an engineer and a contractor that repeatedly have been in lawsuits where it's the same engineer and the same contractor and they kind of have this way of going through the condos and they and they're ending up in a lot of litigation so you know having the vetting from your management company your owner's rep your lawyers finding out who's been in litigation finding out who's on the team finding out who has expertise in that particular type of work because some of these older buildings even some of the newer buildings the work is so unique that's being done some it's normal, it's just concrete restoration rebar, but some because of the configurations of the buildings are so difficult, the logistics of certain high rises are so difficult that some companies are actually way better than others. Um, but I do wanna get, because I know one of the next topics is gonna be what conditions and terms do we wanna put in a contract? I wanna say we'll, that- the first, We'll the first get there. I wanna, I, wanna, okay. I wanna nail down a little bit more on the bidding. Uh, another thing I get asked all the time is the bidding process. How are we going to get the bids in? Who gets to open them? How are we going to compare them? How are we going to choose? How, how does DSS help the boards and property managers navigate that specific part of the bidding process? What works? What doesn't work? What, what are you seeing in your experience, Donald? Well, the bid should come to the board. It should come to DSS also. And then with our team, the engineer, we should put together an analysis of the bid and collectively give that analysis and this first pass to the board and then come up with a short list and interview collectively. It's a dog and pony show, each of the bidders. If it goes out to five contractors, get down to a short list of two or three and have the dog and pony show. And then there's a lot, then there can be a second round of questions that are asked. And then, and well, when you really make the when you, Hold on, hold on. When you do that bid analysis and you present it on, on what we'll say like an apples to apples basis, what if there's a bidder that's 30, 35% lower 40% lower, is that, is that a good sign? Does that raise some eyebrows and questions? Boards are, we have a budget or they're not for profit. Don't we want to go with the cheapest one? Uh, if, if the bid variance is too severe, something's wrong. Exactly. And, I, I, and, and uh, David Haber could probably speak to it, but if you know it and you contract with them, their bond may not be their bonding company and they fail their bonding company may have a way out so so let me let me first talk about the issue of three bids come in at five million dollars and one bid comes in at three million or three million four donald would it be fair to say that your company is going to get into the numbers with that three million four bidder and find out how in the heck they came up with that bid and oftentimes they make a mistake and you have a contract with them and you attach the schedule. And then all of a sudden you find out that they misunderstood part of the bid. And now they want a change order for a million dollars, but you've already started the work and you have a problem. So this is where your owner's rep is going to go to all four of the bidders 
and drill down on the numbers. For example, and I've seen this with Donald and, and, and others a, a hundred times, where someone will shove something into general conditions and have a much lower number for one, two, or three of the categories, and the board just simply can't understand it. Do you, in those cases, go back after the bids are open and say, I want you to re your number, however you get to your number is your number, but I want to see it broken down differently. Do you do that? Yes, we drill down into it. It could be something as simple as a formula error in their spreadsheet. Um, we call it we call it leveling the bids. I mean, so we look we look at you know, so we're putting it all as as David Bodine said onto apples to apples basis. So, so what, we find what, those mistakes in in our leveling process. So not only do you meet with the lawyer, the management company, the engineer, the owner's rep to throw the names into the hat, but before you send out that bid you're meeting with the lawyer and the engineer to do some really important things like, is this a bonded project? Oh, it has one. to be bonded. I, it I, if it has it's to a, be bonded. I agree. I think you breach your fiduciary duty if you don't have a bond on a project more than a quarter of a million dollars. I just, I just think that's something that every board has to do. And then you have to get into, is it a payment and performance bond? Is it a surety bond? Who's negotiating the terms of that bond? I believe it's the owner's rep and the lawyer. But you also have to put certain other things into the bid documents, like what are the hours? Are you allowed to work Saturdays? Are you closed during the Christmas and, 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 and New Year's holidays? Are you closed all three-day holidays like Labor Day, Memorial Day? How much does it cost to demobilize and remobilize for a hurricane? Do you get one free mobilization for free? Um, where do you park their, their employee cars, off-site, on-site? Where do they store materials? These are all things that the owner's rep and the lawyers put into the bid documents. Is that correct, Donald? Yes, and they're negotiated, especially site logistics. And it's really important for the unit owners to understand how the process of remediating a building affects their life living in that building while it's happening uh, balconies are locked out uh, certain areas uh, cannot be used there's chipping noise concrete building it travels throughout the building so uh the staging and logistics plan part. as part of the bidding is is so important because Mainly, we're going to be working on these projects for an occupied building, and they, they were not designed and built to have extra area for staging these significant repair projects. I've seen everything from the parties thought they were assuming they could park and put a 40-yard dumpster here, and it turns out it's not their parking garage, it's a different tower's parking garage, or the master association's parking garage, or they or they all were just going to park on the street. This was a good one. They were all just going to park on the street and submit reimbursements at the full clip of City of Miami Beach street parking for six cars for 18 months. Uh, so all these things, you need the experience of people on your project management side that have been through it, that know the details, that know the things that can go wrong and can help you plan these items out. You can only do so much with the main contract terms, you have to get into the details. You need to be planning out the, I, I the would site plan, for. the logistics, and the, these things need to be part of the bidding and negotiating. So you're not trying to do it at the very end when you've already picked a contractor, you already have a price, you're on the one yard line, but none of these things have been addressed. And then you're going to get blamed for slowing the process down. I, I would also argue that the owner's rep is critical to interface with management. Management is not your owner's rep. Your manager is not the guy or lady who is supposed to sit there and figure out when the pool deck is closed, for how long, how do you coordinate off, how many people are gonna be out there, how many balconies do you need to be on, when do they need to be locked off? 
that needs to be interfaced with the owner's rep, but the owner's rep is the person doing all that work. And in the bid specs, I believe very strongly that you need to have not just the, the, the plan, but when things are going to be closed, because you oftentimes run into a situation where in a high-end luxury building, try telling them that during winter season, you're closing the pool for six months, the entire pool, and the, you know maybe you're closing the gym for three months or whatever the case may be. There are certain, I don't want to say they're political considerations, <laughs> but they are considerations that hot must button, be taken hot into button considerations. hot button considerations. And so Donald and Adam's job is to work through that understanding management and the board's concerns, the limitations, and what the impact on price is going to be. So the reason you put the logistics plan and the timing for the project, because one bidder may say, I'll do it in 24 months, and the other bidder may say, I'll do it in 18 months. And one bidder may say, I'm closing down the whole building at one time, and another bidder may say, I'm going to do this half, then I'm going to switch to this half. All of that affects price. Um, you know, the labor force you put in and the time that you put that labor force in a project all affects your cost. So that's, that's part of the apples to apples, isn't it, Adam? It absolutely is part of it. I mean, we're, we're operating in a fully occupied building, as David said a few minutes ago. So the logistics are absolutely critical to make sure that we minimize the disruption to the community as much as possible. And I think that's one of the places where DSS condo, it, it, you know, our expertise really shines because we do this for condominiums day in and day out. I actually live in a condominium, so I know the pain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, 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 you know, there, there's a lot of information to get from the contractors post bid in this interview process post initial bid that helps tighten the criteria that the, the job's going to be run under. It's really impossible to get it all in the bid document. There is a learning process in analyzing the bid and speaking to the contractors and part of the negotiation that becomes a refinement process. Uh, and I just wanted to make that clear that it isn't all up front in the bid document. I think one of the points, I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to say one of the, the point that we're making is it's a lot of work, right? I mean, going through this process is a tremendous amount of work. And I think that, you know, as, as we said earlier, as David Haber said earlier, Board members are volunteers and you don't, you know, board members don't have the time to be able to manage a process like this. They have the, neither the time nor the expertise to manage a process like this without giving up their entire personal lives. So having an owner's rep on board is absolutely essential. Um, Adam, can you talk about how your company as an owner's rep can work with a condo on different um, payment structures at different points um, within the project from the pre-bid to post-bid to actual construction and whether or not you can um, have varying levels of involvement and cost so that they're not getting charged all the same amount at the same time you know, all the way through the project. Absolutely, David, thank you for that question. So we typically operate in four phases and there's a different price per phase. And the, and it's, it's, uh, the price is determined by which, you know, which level of, of talent we need to have on the talent and experience we need on, on that particular phase and how much time we have to spend on site versus in our office. But we have, uh, we have what we call the planning phase which is to just get the, the basics of the project well understood to what's our scope, what's, what's a preliminary cost, not a final cost, but just what are we talking about here? And if we were gonna say a not to exceed, what would that look like? Who are the right professionals that need to be involved? And just 
the general, let's say, scope of the project, creating a plan, a preliminary budget and schedule. So there's one fee for that. Then we get into pre-construction and pre-construction is where we start to you know, get seriously uh, detailed about the, the documents, the drawings, et cetera. We go through the bidding process that we've just spent a few minutes talking about. We get into permitting and we start to have a lot of involvement in the project, although not necessarily on site every day. So there's another fee for that. Then we get into construction administration where we are on site virtually every single day. And in that phase, you know, we're there to, uh, you know, make sure things are going well, to supervise, um, you know, the project participants, to solve problems as they come up, to communicate with the property managers and coordinate and collaborate with the property managers on, on issues like, as we were talking about, when does the pool have to be closed? How do we communicate things to the clients? I mean, to, excuse me, to the unit owners. And then uh, the final phase is closeout, which is you know an art form in and of itself to say, okay, we are close, all right, we're almost there. But by, by that point, you know, it's it's the dotting of the eyes and the crossing of the T's, the touching up of paint, making sure that everything is pristine, that the liens have been released properly, that warranties have been um, you know uh, properly provided, and that everyone has been paid. Uh, Adam, on that issue of warranties, because I was asked earlier, what's a proper length of warranty from the contractor? And I said, they're going to try to limit it to a year and you're going to want to try to get it two to five. No contractors are going to give you beyond that. And on the manufacturer's warranty, they're not going to give you a warranty unless their rep is there seeing the paint application, seeing the waterproofing application, making sure it's done by a qualified contractor who's approved to install their product, which is one of the things the owner's rep is going to look into when the engineer is specking the project. Are you specking a product that there's only one person in town that's right. authorized to install? Because when you do that, you have a monopoly, you're not going to be able to negotiate very much. Whereas on the other hand, if there is a product that there are seven people in town that can actually perform the work and get the warranty for, that's going to be better. So you're going to interface with the engineer on the bid specs as well for things like that. Is that correct? Absolutely. 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 Right. And, we, and we specifically look for products, you know, that are, let's say, commonly applied, you know, that there's, you know, that they're known in the marketplace and a lot of different contractors can work with them. And now with waterproofing, the whole surf side issue with waterproofing and water intrusion into the garage, I think there's going to be a lot more emphasis on getting a 15 to 20 year warranty on waterproofing, which will cost an extra hundred or $150,000 possibly. However, it means you don't have to rip up the tile every seven years to rewaterproof at an expense well, of a half a million to a million and a half dollars. Well, is that David, what, what you're know? really talking about is not in a sense, the length of the warranty, but the quality of the, pro of the product that's being applied, the longevity, because the product doesn't know what its warranty is. Great if, point. If, if it's Great applied point. properly and if it is the best product. The other, thing, the other thing, Donald, is you negotiate what's called an overburden warranty. Can you explain what an overburden warranty is? Well, because I, I, I was the just difference between a bucket... It. A bucket warranty versus an overburden warranty is like well, the difference between a Chevette and a Ferrari. Well, typically for planters, you're not going to get an overburden warranty because that involves taking up all of the dirt in the plant out of the planter, repairing and putting them back. So when you're looking at waterproofing, different than roofing, there is a warranty for the waterproofing itself, a labor and material warranty, but the overburden is on the owner. When you're looking at roofing, there is a called an NDL, a no dollar limit warranty. And since there typically is not overburden on a roof, unless it's a green roof, then the roof warranty covers everything, except it's got a limitation on wind speed. You can buy riders. You can buy high wind speed riders for 175 miles an hour. 
So you can buy, in essence, where a warranty would otherwise be negated from an event of God, you know, force majeure, hurricane, you can buy a special warranty that will up your warranty to, in essence, cover a hurricane. Is that correct? Cover a certain wind speed, and that's called a rider. Okay, so that's something that- You buy duration. And when you buy the duration, the quality of the- product is improved with longer duration. That's why okay. I go back to the original statement. It's about buying quality products and applying them properly. So and that's where, piece of paper. and again, this is where the owner's rep is critical, critical. Because when an engineer does a spec, sometimes they do the spec for what they think is the best because it gives them the best protection. But if you can't find more than one person in town that can apply it, the owner's rep is the one who says, guys, that's a great spec, but we got to be practical. Nobody's going to apply that in South Florida other than, you know, Joe Smith Roofing. And Joe Smith Roofing charges three times as much as everybody else. And there's a product out there that's equally as good, but there are seven people who can apply it. Or they're approved applicators. Right. And, 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 and the warranty on that may be better. I know we have to wrap up. So David, do you want, I think you get final comments since you've spoken the least. You, you touched on the thing I wanted to make sure got brought up in terms of the warranty. I always see these contractors try to ram through what we like to just call a bucket warranty. And in today's economic climate, it's important to make sure you're looking at these things because they try to limit their dollar amount liability to the cost of the materials when they purchase them. Well, three, four years later after the project, that, that cost might not help as well. So I'm glad Donald touched on the no dollar limit warranty. That's very important. I think we could definitely do another one of these when we talk about um, pitfalls to avoid during the project and at the project uh, closeout. As Adam talked about, the project closeout, that's an art in, in and of itself in terms of getting everything done, getting the inspections, getting the warranties issued, getting the lien released, getting people paid. Uh, fighting off some of those excessive change orders and whatnot. So also, also uh, delay claims and uh, penalties and what you know, how many rain days do they get and change orders for time? Oh yeah, my, Sometimes my, fa orders. my favorite one is rain delay change orders that are only signed by one party, and then I receive about seventeen of them uh, the day before final payment is due. And uh, but anyways, I want to bring uh, up you. one one last thing. One last point from Donald, Adam, and then we'll wrap One up. last point, which we didn't touch on, is the contract exhibit. They actually are a material part of the whole thing. And we could have a webinar on contract exhibits because there's a long list of them from bond form, forms, warranties, logistic plans, unit cost, schedule of values, you name it, it's in the exhibit. The contract terms may govern it, but it's all in the exhibit, the list of the plans and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Adam, did you want to? Well, from my side, thoughts? from my side, I just wanted to say that it's it's my great pleasure to work for the condominium community here in South Florida. And you know, thanks again to David Bodine and David Haber and, and, and uh, Dave Haber Law for having us on this webinar today. It was a pleasure and a privilege, and we look forward to, you know, joining you again in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone that attended. I see a number of familiar names there, some new names. If you have questions, you can reach out, call us, email us, and uh, we'll get another one of these scheduled to go over uh, the middle phase and the closeout phase. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Stay safe.